Hey guys, my name is Sam and welcome to Prepmatic. Today we are talking the ins and outs of croup, what you can do as a parent and as a first responder. Before we really get into this video, I need to put out the disclaimer. This video is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Always refer to local state laws, regulations, and protocols. That being said, as of right now, I believe all of this information is correct, but medical science does change over time. So if you're watching this video at any time in the future, which is literally everybody, make sure you're doing your own research and understanding that there might be new recommendations out. With all of that being said, let's get into the video. So croup is a self-limiting upper respiratory infection that usually affects children between the ages of six months and three years old. It is generally more common in males. Now, croup is a very, very common respiratory infection, and most parents are probably going to experience it at some point, especially if their child goes to daycare. Croup is generally caused by either the parainfluenza virus 1 or 2 and can also present after an infection with RSV. All of these things are very, very common in the pediatric population. So croup is also known as laryngotracheal bronchitis, which basically means that it is the inflammation of the larynx, the trachea, and the bronchi. The onset of croup is usually after about three days of some kind of upper respiratory infection like we talked about earlier. If it is an extremely rapid onset, you should suspect something else, and we'll talk about differential diagnoses later in this video. The symptoms of croup can be divided between mild, moderate, and severe, but there is overlap between each category. You'll notice that the official grading scale of croup is a point-based system, which means you can have a symptom of severe croup, but not actually fall into that category if you don't meet the points required. This is really not here nor there, but if you are a clinician and you're looking at uh, making a determination for this child, especially EMS providers, whether you should transport or not, this is a good thing to know where to look up. Now, the mild symptoms, the hallmark that you're going to see is the seal bark cough. And I've got some videos of that. My son just had this infection, so I got some videos. I'll also put in some other audio sources uh, from different uh, videos that I've seen over the years. <coughs> Now, that seal bark cough should really clue you into uh, the start of this infection. It's usually the first thing you'll notice. The next thing you might notice is strider when the child is severely upset or doing something that involves a lot of respiratory effort. Strider is a high-pitched noise that comes about with an upper airway instruction, usually on inhalation. It is not wheezing, which is heard down in the lungs. This is going to be more up in the throat, which makes sense because croup, like I just said, is an inflammation of the larynx and trachea, essentially up here, not down in your lungs. Now, as you get to more severe croup symptoms, you can have a little bit of retractions. Essentially what this means is when the child breathes in, you'll have the uh, muscles between the ribs will suck in and it will just, it's just them trying to get a little bit more power out of their breath. These are called accessory muscles. So you can also have retractions up here and then under the sternum. If you're starting to see retractions under the sternum, this is going to be a sign of a little bit more severe infection. In moderate croup, you might also see strider at rest with the child. Now, when we get into severe croup, this starts to be your imminent airway obstruction. This child needs to be resuscitated immediately. This is relatively rare, and I'll be honest, I've never seen it in my uh, tenure career as a paramedic, but it can definitely still happen. So when you have severe croup, you're going to look for cyanosis. This is blueness around the lips, uh, face, nail beds, anything like this. This is a sign that they're very hypoxic. They're not getting enough oxygen. You're going to have severe retractions and accessory muscle use. So they're really doing everything they can to take a deep breath. You might have diminished lung sounds and you might even lose strider as that airway obstruction becomes more and more profound. The biggest kind of worrisome sign in any pediatric disease, sickness, anything is going to be altered mental status. So if the child is severely agitated or listless and 
going unresponsive, these are signs that this hypoxia is getting to a critical point and this child needs intervention. So if you have any signs or symptoms of severe croup, that is a 911 call right away, no questions asked, get them to the hospital for appropriate resuscitation. I can never recommend somebody throws the kid in the back of the car, you can't monitor them well and you don't have the tools to treat them on the way to the hospital, where most ambulances are going to carry a lot of the treatments we're going to talk about later on in this video. As far as moderate croup, this is gonna be a judgment call and you should at least consult your primary care provider. Honestly, this is one of those situations where if you are unsure as a parent, if you're just, you're not quite comfortable with where it is, your kid's having difficulty breathing, you're never wrong to call 911. You'd rather be safe than sorry. As far as mild croup goes, if you can't determine it, you can still call 911, you can still take them in. However, generally, mild croup can be managed at home very effectively. Just make sure that you are monitoring your child and you are aware of the risks going forward. So let's talk about treatments. We're gonna go through everything that you can do at home all the way through what they're gonna do in the ambulance and hospital. And I'm going through everything just because I've got a wide range of viewers on this channel, everything from your concerned parents to uh, first responders that just want a quick refresher in this information. So two things that you can do as a parent at home, and neither one of these are really uh, studied a whole lot. There's not a lot of demonstrated benefits outside of anecdotal reports. Now, my anecdotal report is one of them, and this has been common teaching for a long time, even in uh, EMT school when I went through like 11, 12 years ago, we were taught this. So take it with a grain of salt, but understand like I've seen it work as of last week and a lot of parents swear by it. You can put your kid in a hot, steamy room. So you can turn on the shower as hot as it goes, sit with them in the bathroom, let the uh, room steam up. Now, I'm not saying put them in the scalding water, all right? I'm saying put them in the hot bathroom. And that humidity can oftentimes ease their sore throat and just make it a little bit easier for them to breathe. The next thing you can do is actually the exact opposite end of the spectrum, and that's take them outside into cool, crisp night air. A lot of times we will have kids where we respond to their house, they have croup, they've got this seal bark cough, they've got inspiratory strider at rest, and we carry them out to the ambulance, and just in that trip between the house and the ambulance, you'll lose some of that strider at rest. So it can definitely be effective, at least in a short term. When my child had croup, what we'd do is we'd do the shower uh, during the day, and then right before bed, we'd take him outside, and that seemed to do a lot to at least help him get to sleep. One thing to avoid is cough medicine. There are some downsides to that, and it is not recommended in a croup case. One medicine you can give is ibuprofen, and this is an anti-inflammatory, therefore it helps with some of the inflammation in the throat and can ease some of that pain and burden on the child. Tylenol will work to reduce fever and make them feel a little bit better, but it doesn't actually have any physical actions on the throat, so in this case, I'd lean more towards that ibuprofen. Obviously, always do this under the guidance of your primary care provider and dose it accordingly. If it gets to the point where the child has moderate to severe croup and you call 911 or you take them into the hospital, there are a couple treatments that are going to be done almost universally. The first one is going to be nebulized racemic epinephrine. So racemic epinephrine just goes in your standard nebulizer. If you're on an ambulance, you put the bullet in and then you have to reconstitute with a little bit of saline. And this is just going to help open up those airways. It's a very safe medication to give. And most 911 agencies across the United States will be able to administer it. The second thing they're going to do in the hospital is administer some dexamethasone. And this is a uh, corticosteroid that basically helps ease some of that inflammation and in a little bit of a longer term than your racemic epinephrine. One interesting fact about dexamethasone, if you want to keep the kid calm, it doesn't necessarily need to be given IM or IV. It can actually be drank right out of the vial. You can mix it with some juice or something else that tastes good. Otherwise, it's very bitter. So this isn't me recommending that you do it, but just know that it is possible with this particular medication. If a child receives racemic epinephrine, they have to be observed for three to four hours at a minimum, which means if you're on an ambulance, you respond to a croupy kid, you give them racemic epi and they seem to be doing better, this is not a child you should be refusing. You need to transport them to the hospital. If you are going to ref 
refuse that patient AMA, the parent doesn't want them transported, this is a time where I would highly recommend you call your medical director to get that release. In your moderate to severe croup, obviously you're going to give supplementary oxygen if they are hypoxic, and sometimes heated high flow is going to be placed on the patient. BiPAP is a little less common in these cases, but it can be performed, and then of course, you can go all the way up to intubation. With these children, it is very important that you keep them calm. The more upset a child is, the more inflamed that airway will become. In mild cases, if you get them really upset, they might get that strider. In moderate to severe, it might bring them to the next level. So just trying to keep them calm, not crying, allow them to sit with mom if it's safe to do so, and not subjecting them to tests that you don't necessarily need to run. While croup is a clinical diagnosis and generally that seal bark cough will clue you into uh, this case being croup, there are a couple other differential diagnoses you have to keep in mind. And the main one I wanna draw your attention to is going to be epiglottitis. So this is an inflammation of the epiglottis. Now this can be extremely life-threatening and this is a child that you don't want to do anything to make them upset because they will lose their airway instantly. Generally speaking, the way I would differentiate this in the field is going to be a child that is trying not to move their head. They might have a hot potato voice. So this is a voice where they're just trying not to move their vocal cords very much. And then they are leaning forward in a tripod position. They're sticking out their jaw and they're drooling. They don't want to swallow. These are all signs that this is potentially an epiglottis case, epiglottitis case. In these instances, these kids, like I just said, have to be kept very calm. If the child does require immediate airway intervention, this intubation attempt has to be done by the most experienced intubator that you have access to, which is probably not a paramedic. This is probably a pediatric anesthesiologist at a children's hospital, if at all possible. There are some other uh, differential diagnoses. I'll leave them up here. But once again, this seal bark cough is relatively indicative of croup. That's all I have for this video. I hope it helped. Obviously, this is not a comprehensive video and there's a lot of other resources online you can check out. With all of that being said, I will see you next week.